good morning everybody and it's indeed a pleasure here to be talking on the topic of diabetes and the eye uh, because this is uh, i think one of the most important uh, diseases especially in today's era with the increasing incidence of diabetes and as i think all of us are aware with india soon becoming the diabetic capital of the world i would just like to begin with this picture i think most of us would have seen then it keeps making the rounds of social media this relates to the discovery of insulin wherein uh, insulin was injected into this uh, children with type 1 diabetes uh, who were all comatose from ketoacidosis and the children slowly started waking up before the discovery of insulin mortality in this children was 100% of course treatment of diabetes and its complications has come a long way since then so just like diabetes affects the whole body it also affects the entire eye all portions so just to have an overview uh, on the ocular surface it can cause recurrent size collisions or blepharitis uh, on the it can also cause on the lids in on the ocular surface it can lead to dry eye and decreased corneal sensitivity cataract occurs earlier in patients with diabetes in the retina we are going to address the most uh, uh, important complication that is diabetic retinopathy but along with it diabetes is also contributory to retinal arterial and venous occlusions and uh, as a secondary complication to them you can have what is called as neovascular glaucoma that is formation of new blood vessels in the anterior chamber of the eye which leads to an increase in the pressure in the eye and the neurological manifestations in relation to eye are the cranial nerve palsy is mainly third nerve palsy which happens with diabetes uh, something called anterior ischemic optic neuropathy where the blood supply to the optic nerve head is uh, damaged leading to uh, damage of the nerve fibers and of course cortical blindness so we know that uh, diabetic retinopathy is a mas uh, microvasculopathy and it uh, worsens with longer duration of diabetes and poorer control of blood sugar mainly but also it, it is concerned with control of the hypertension the lipids in the patient their renal function and status their uh, hemoglobin levels and uh, what is interesting again is that retina is the one place in the body where we can see living blood vessels and we can see the changes occurring in them and uh, it is very important because uh, it is a leading cause of blindness in the working age group and what is important is that it is essentially asymptomatic again until it reaches a very advanced stage like there is a bleeding of vitreous hemorrhage into the eye or large amount of proliferative membranes cause a tractional retinal detachment or there is edema in the macula so just a quick glance at the classification it is basically starts as non proliferative this is the fundus photograph and this is a fundus fluorescein angiogram image this is mild non proliferative diabetic retinopathy where there are very few changes these red dots that you see in here which are microaneurysms it increases to go to moderate and then increases still further to what is called as severe non proliferative or what used to be called as pre pre proliferative disease if you look at proliferative this is where you have new blood vessels forming these new blood vessels are ruptured here and there's a little bit of hemorrhage which you can see in the angiogram also and this is another large hemorrhage in the macula and this is an angiogram of a patient who is showing these bright spots here are the new blood vessels and these dark areas over here are where the entire capillary perfusion in this eye has been lost and the other important co uh, complication is edema in the macula the center part of the retina which is called clinically significant macular edema which used to be called focal or diffuse but nowadays with the newer treatment of anti vagus in of intravitreal injections we call them as non center involving versus center involving diabetic macular edema and then you have advanced diabetic eye disease wherein especially the proliferative disease goes unchecked or uncontrolled and it leads to formation of these large fibromascular membranes in the retina which causes a detachment of the retina and of course severe vision loss as a consequence of this now there are various investigative modalities that we use to uh, determine what is happening in the uh, in the in the retina in patients with diabetic retinopathy the one of the most important is fundus fluorescein angiography herein we inject the fluorescein dye which is an iodine based dye in the anticubital vein and measure, look at the circulation of the flow of the dye through the retinal blood vessels by a fundus camera capturing images using special filters which captures the fluorescence of this dye and uh, what is important to know is that this dye is potentially has the ca capability of causing reactions uh, nausea and vomiting is very common uh, another slightly common is the occurrence of urticaria but in rare situations it can also cause anaphylaxis uh, it the procedure is relatively contraindicated in patients with renal compromise mainly because the dye is excreted through the kidneys 
and uh, if the renal function is not adequate the dye will stay longer in the body and can increase the risk of complications also patients with significant cardiac anomalies can uh, uh, be contraindicated because the procedure itself can cause stress can cause uh, fluid retention and also because a, a slow in cardiac flow or a cardiac output can reflect in a slower uh, circulation in the fundus and we may misinterpret as a problem with the retinal circulation whereas it's a problem of the general circulation a few images again here this is a the macula of the eye and you can see this whole dark area indicate there's no perfusion here so this is called as macular ischemia which means this patient will not only have very poor vision but will also respond very poorly to treatment both in the form of reduction of treatment in our scans or what we see and also in the, the terms of any gain in vision and this is a patient who's got this large proliferative membrane on the posterior pole his optic nerve head or disc is somewhere here his macula is here and you can see a huge amount of the peripheral retina is non perfused this is obviously a very advanced damage due to diabetes in this eye another condition we all know is asteroid hyalosis where you have these calcium crystals or granules in the vitreous which makes a view of the retina very difficult but because the blue light used in fundus fluorescence and angiography can cross these crystals you get an ffa image which is almost normal and you can very easily pick up the neovascularized process which is happening in this eye and helps you diagnose this which you may miss on just an examination of the eye there is also something that is called as featureless retina wherein this on an examination this appears like something as a moderate NPDR but if you do an angiogram you can pick up these uh, neovascularization process which is occurring over here uh, this can occur again in patients who have some amount of renal compromise or slowly indolent diseases optical coherence tomography or OCT is a very widely used uh, uh, investigative modality by us today um, it uh, not only helps us to qual classify and determine the various features of uh, diabetic macular edema but also to monitor progress of treatment uh, these pictures which I am showing here of the OCT and you saw of the fundus camera before are older pictures which I have been using in my presentation for long and continue using for uh, uh, kind of a sentimental value because they show some of my very close colleagues whom I have worked with we have a, a state of the art spectralis machine which does the angiographies and the OCTs for us nowadays so just to for orientation this is a normal OCT scan a spectral domain OCT scan of the macula this is the normal foveal dip which occurs in the macula and this is the choroid which is visualized below this over here is the optic nerve head so if you see it can show us macular edema you can see this retina is definitely edematous and the structure and architecture is destroyed it can also show various features like this is a large amount of submacular fluid which is occurring we take all these factors into consideration in decision making for treatment also it can show you if the vitreous is adherent to the center of the macula causing a pull so when you examine this eye it looks like there is an edematous cyst but if you see there is a traction over here sometimes this traction gets relieved on its own sometimes it may need surgery these are two eyes of the same patient you can see right eye has more than the left eye it can also help you determine the extent of a tractional retinal detachment caused by the membrane and of course the most important use is to monitor response to treatment so this is a patient who has this extensive macular edema with a lot of subretinal fluid and he's receiving intravitreal injections after one injection there is reduction after the second reduction injection there's further reduction so to monitor response to treatment to make retreatment uh, decision we use uh, the optical coherence tomography so the when we come to management of diabetic macular edema the gold standard in today's era is intravitreal injections which are two groups of agents one is the anti VEGF VEGF vascular endothelial growth factor drug on the other one is steroid lasers which used to be the treatment previously are nowadays used only in non center involving DME or as an adjunct to injections so anti vegas form the first line of treatment and they are used not only for treating macular edema due to diabetes but also for treating macular edema due to vein occlusions and also for treating choroidal neovascular membrane secondary to age related macular degeneration in the setting of diabetes they are used preoperatively to reduce the vascularity of the membrane so it makes resecting and removing these membranes in surgery easier they carry a certain cardiovascular risk because of blockage of the wedges i'm sorry and so when we have a patient who has a recent history of uh, and myocardial infarction or a stroke we avoid the use of anti wedges for within 6 months steroids are usually second line of treatment for non responders to anti wedges or can be first line in these patients who have had a recent stroke or mi or in patients with a very chronic edema 
uh, triamcinolone and acetonide is very cheap and easily available but has a little more risk of increased intraocular pressure in cataract. This is the Ozodex implant in the eye. Uh, this is a device which is slightly expensive but is very good and has excellent efficacy in treatment. So for non-central involving as I said we do lasers to the macular area to the microaneurysms and area of thickening. And the other main use of laser photocoagulation is when you have proliferative disease that is new blood vessel forming in the eye, we perform what is called pan retinal photocoagulation that is we do laser to the entire peripheral part of the retina just sparing the area within the arcades and around the disc. So this is an uh, image of an eye which has received fresh laser so these all spots are yellow. Over time these lasers scar and become dark like this and uh, the laser acts to cause regression of the new blood vessels. Uh, the the action takes about 2 to 3 months to occur so we observe the patient after the 3 settings of laser and if there is still activity we may need to do additional laser add on laser again and uh, uh, it, so what happens very often is patients with diabetic macular edema will develop a vitreous hemorrhage and they will come to us with saying sudden decrease in vision and floaters and we will see the new blood vessels and if there is visible retina we will do a laser. Now this laser is going to lead to a reduction in the neovascular process and the vitreous hemorrhage is going to slowly clear over time on its own. So patient will not perceive any difference immediately after treatment and the laser does not cause the hemorrhage to clear. And ironically sometimes when you have large neovascularization which starts regressing and contracting with the laser that itself can lead to a increased bleeding actually in the eye. So it is quite a difficult task to make patients understand what we are trying to do. And of course, we have to check their systemic status and achieve optimal control of their blood sugar levels. So, this is a patient education video that we use about how the diabetic retinopathy occurs and uh, its response to treatment. Kindly note it explains what the retina is to the patient so that they understand. நோயின் ஆரம்ப காலங்களில் கண்ணுக்குள்ள ரத்த திட்டுகளும் தண்ணீர் மாதிரி கசிவும் ஏற்படும் இது மேலும் பாதிப்பு ஆச்சுன்னா விழித்திரையில் வலிமை இல்லாத கசிகின்ற ரத்த குழாய்கள் உற்பத்தி ஆகும் இக்குழாய்களை கட்டுப்படுத்தலன்னா வலிமையற்ற குழாய்கள் உடைஞ்சி கண்ணுக்குள் ரத்த கசிவு ஏற்படும் ரத்த கசிவினால் கண் பார்வை குறையும் இயல்பான கண் பார்வை எப்படி காணாம போகுதுன்னு இங்க நீங்க பார்க்கலாம் இது இன்னும் மோசமாயிட்டே போனா கண்ணுக்குள்ள ஜவ்வு மாதிரி உருவாகி விழித்திரியை இழுத்து கிழிய வைக்கும் இந்த புது புது ரத்த குழாய்களை கட்டுப்படுத்துறதுக்கு விழித்திரையின் பரப்பளவு முழுவதும் லேசர் சிகிச்சை செய்யப்படுகிறது இந்த லேசர் சிகிச்சைய மூன்று முறை செய்யணும் ஒவ்வொரு லேசருக்கும் ஒரு வாரம் இடைவெளி விட்டு பண்ணணும் உங்களுக்கு சர்க்கரை நோயினால நரம்புல நீர் கோர்த்து இருந்தா கண்ணுக்குள்ள ஊசி போடணும் இரத்த கசிவு ரொம்ப இருந்தாலோ விழித்திரை விலகி போனாலோ அறுவை சிகிச்சை தேவைப்படும் இந்த சிகிச்சையினால கண் so that brings us to vitrectomy for diabetic retinopathy so when the diabetic damage to the retina becomes advanced less leading to tractional retinal detachment which is involving the center part or the non resolving vitreous hemorrhage mainly we need to do surgery so this is how an eye with extensive membranes due to diabetes and a tractional retinal detachment is looking pre operatively and this is the image of the same eye after surgery where the membranes have been cleared the retina is attached and silicon oil is placed which is a shiny reflex you see for attachment of the retina example of another eye with the advanced disease which has undergone recent surgery and this is another eye which has macular hemorrhage just in front of the macula so the remaining retina is free but as it's in front of the macula the patient's vision is very poor and this eye because there's no detachment may not need an oil and just needs a vitrectomy this is a post operative day one image so that's why there's some amount of dispersed hemorrhage and it looks a little blurred a short video of a surgery so the approach is through what is called as the pars plana that is behind the limbus of the eye through these small ports this is three port pars plana vitrectomy this is vitrectomy being done with the cutter and this is the blood which is in the front of the macula which is now been slowly cleared out you can see the proliferative membrane which is there over here slowly this blood is cleared out and this membrane is 
then prim. Now this is a dye, brilliant blue green dye which is being injected into the eye to stain the internal limiting membrane which is the innermost layer of the 10 layers of retina and the inner internal limiting membrane is being peeled here. This helps in relieving any folds on the macula and here endo laser is being done. The fresh spots you can see are uh, yellow and the old spots are dark. This is a patient with a far more advanced disease where there is an extensive membrane which is completely adherent and the entire retina is detached off and this needs a lot of manipulation and you need to do a lot of things to slowly dissect out of the membrane with forceps, with scissors and with the cutter to clear these membranes from the entire surface of the retina slowly and gradually painstakingly and then the retina is slowly attached back in position and laser is now being done to the entire retina and here uh, after lasering the breaks which usually occur in such cases now silicon oil has been filled in the retina for internal tamponade. So what we need to remember, we ophthalmologists especially need to remember that we are not just treating an eye, we are treating the entire patient and sometimes the problems are not just related to the eye, it can go beyond that. So I will give a few examples. So this is a patient, I think all of you all can also now see, he has got a massive macular edema. So he was seen in the OPD and was advised the intravitreal injection for this macular edema as is the treatment protocol. Patient turns up, this is about 2 to 3 months later and there is a significant decrease in the macular edema now. What did this macular edema respond to? So if you see in the first instance, his sugars were 500 milligram percent and because of which obviously he could not receive an intravitreal injection, he did not come up for follow up, he had his sugars controlled, now they are better controlled at 250 and you can just see a systemic control itself has caused so much of a reduction in his macular edema. This is a patient who had extensive nephropathy also. And you can see he came with very poor vision, you can see the disc is pale, all the blood vessels are completely white which means they are sclerosed and this is the OCT which is showing a, a very thinning of the retina and an angiogram revealed an absolute loss of perfusion in the posterior pole of the eye. So what happens is systemically not only do we obviously need a good systemic control for a good outcome for any treatment that we give but there are also certain other factors like patients with renal failure have an increased fluid load. And this it also can cause an increase in the diabetic macular edema and many of these patients with bad nephropathy develop bad retinopathy and need surgery and during surgery they cannot lie down long enough. These surgeries take somewhere around uh, 45 minutes to an hour and they can't lie down and tend to develop a fluid load and PCS and so we need to plan their surgery and schedule it in respect to their dialysis schedule so that the fluid load is minimum when we take them up for surgery. And we also need to look, when we look at the fundus, when we look inside the eye, it is not just diabetic retinopathy. So this is a patient who has got this edema on the optic nerves on both sides which is also seen in the scan in the uh, over here. So this is anterior ischemic optic neuropathy uh, which is damaged to the blood vessel supplying the optic nerve head and very often results in irreversible uh, vision loss. So once this edema goes away, the disc becomes atrophic and the vision gets permanently reduced. So this is another example, this is just to show what my cubicle is like. This is a gentleman with bilateral vitreous hemorrhage coming to my room for his pre-operative workshop. But just to give you an idea of what my cubicle looks like and this is the chair and the patient has to come and sit here. So now what happened is one day I, I met a, a gentleman in his mid 40s comes to me saying that he is having defective vision for 2 weeks and he is stumbling and bumping into the chair as he is walking and he is asking my sister to help him to sit on the chair. When I open his case sheet which we have on EMR nowadays, I see that his vision is 6-9 and I don't know and I, what I am expecting is he has got the peripheral vitreous hemorrhage or something with the central macula which is clear and hence he can see. But when I look into his eyes, his fundus shows just a moderate NPDR. So I go deep, dig deeper, you know, I am not happy, I am not happy with what I am seeing. So when I dig deeper, now he tells me that he has been bumping into things and bumping into the wall while walking since the past two weeks. So I refer him across to Dr. Priya, our neuro consultant and she, therein we then noticed that he has a, a homonymous hemo, hemianopia and that he had cortical issues which was causing his vision problem and it was not something related to his retina or his eye. So screening is very important. So like we have seen now, early stages are asymptomatic. In fact, even proliferative disease which occurs in the periphery can be asymptomatic until and unless it bleeds or it causes a fractional detachment which is an advanced damage. But less than 50% of patients get screened for diabetic retinopathy. And we need to remember that once vision is blurred, 
the damage which occurs is permanent and a normal vision can rarely be recovered and hence every type 2 diabetic should be screened at the time of diagnosis because type 2 diabetes can be silent type 1 diabetic need to be screened 3 to 5 years after diagnosis because type 1 diabetes is never silent it's always detected as its onset other than of course controlling the systemic parameters physicians need to refer their patients to ophthalmologists for screening so that we can prevent this from becoming something like this thank you